there, Kisma? This is a little bit different because we're on video. We're on video. We're on Zoom. We're on and, Zoom. Uh, and I, I mean, I can't even ex contain myself. I'm so <laughs> excited to have this guest that we have on today. Uh, we've studied his work. We've talked about his work. We covered his work in a four-part series at the beginning of last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are just so incredibly excited to have Gay Hendricks with us today. Yep. So yeah. thank you and welcome, Dr. Gay Hendricks, to Illuminate Podcast. We're so happy you're here. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to meet both of you. Thank you. You know, there was something we've been we've been watching some of your interviews and because this is Illumination podcast and we love talking about ancient wisdom for modern day success. And we had listened to an interview you did with Amrit. I think he's in Australia and just a really lovely effervescent um, man. And you had shared something about your initial what I what I feel like you called an awakening. You were around mm -hmm. 23, 24 and you there was an event that happened. And I was wondering if you would share with our listeners that event, because I had never heard it or read about it. And when you talked mm -hmm. about it, it was so compelling and, and gave so much hope by, uh, to me anyway. So I was wondering if we could just start there. Absolutely. Well, I wouldn't be here without that event having, having happened. Um, if you look at me today, I, I'm about six feet tall and I weigh about 180 pounds. So I look like an athlete pretty much. And so when I was 24 years old, though, I looked completely different. You wouldn't have recognized me. I had suffered from childhood, from childhood obesity. There was something glandularly wrong. And I was taken around to different medical. I was the only fat person in a skinny family and everybody else was skinny and I was eating the same thing I, they were. So why was I fat? And so I was taken around to different uh, medical specialists and put on diets and pumped full of <laughs> you know what, I don't know what, but I, uh, I was experimented along a lot and I didn't really lose the weight to it until I had this enlightenment event when I was 24 years old. And so when I was 24, I'd managed to create a life which was pretty painful, actually, because I not only weighed 320 pounds, but I, I, I wore big, thick glasses and I was in a relationship that was really toxic. I'd been in for a couple of years and I couldn't figure out how to get out of it. And I was also in a job that wasn't going real well and I didn't feel like I was using any of my potential. And so one day everything came to a head. Uh, I went out for a walk after I'd had an argument with um, Linda, the woman I referred to, and I was going out for a walk to um, try to get my head cleared. And by golly, I got it cleared big time. <laughs> and, uh, what happened was I stepped on a place uh, where the snow had covered the ice. I lived in New England at the time, and I was working in a little school for delinquent boys up there as a teacher and counselor. And so my feet shot out from under me, and I went whoop, down on my back. And I didn't knock myself out, but I I call it an out of Hendrix experience because I had this experience that uh, I don't know where it came from, but I went down whoop, and it kind of knocked me out of my senses for about two or three minutes. It knocked me out of my usual way of looking at the world. And I lay there and I was laying there on this frozen road and I had this amazing thing happen for about two minutes where I got a look at who I really was. It was like I could see all the way down through the different levels of myself. I could see my, my fat was there to, in a way, to insulate me from the outside world and to keep my feelings inside myself. But then I could see down underneath all the fat was all these tense muscles where I was trying to hold my muscles real tight to kind of, I think, keep my feelings from just spilling out of my body because I'd never, ever talked to anybody about all the things I was scared about and angry about and sad about. And they all just happened there in that moment where I suddenly became aware of this whole different set of levels in myself. But then the really magical thing that happened was that I realized that down underneath all of my old feelings and all of the fat and everything was this part of myself that I call pure consciousness that I'd never touched into it before, but it's the part that we all have of ourselves, the, the pure consciousness that doesn't have any programming on it. It's just 
us. And I'd never really felt that before. And it gave me a new place to come home to. And then what happened was, as I was laying there, I could feel my old personality begin to come back together. And I, oh, I smoked heavily at the time too. I smoked two or three packs of Marlboros a day. And I could realize, oh, I want a cigarette again. And, oh, I got to go home. And, oh, I'm freezing on this road. And all of my, you know, it's like the regular, my life came back again. But I had this one moment before I fully got back up. I said to the universe or to God or to spirit or someone, I said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to feel that pure consciousness all the time, because it was the first time I felt like I'd really come home in myself. And so that commitment, I think, made the difference because I came back out and I went back home and I still had the same relationship and everything, but everything was different. And the most amazing couple of things happened right away. One was I decided to go on a radical diet of eating only things that I'd never eaten before. And so uh, I don't necessarily recommend this, but it sure worked for me because, see, every, I figured this way. Everything I've eaten up until now made me weigh 320 pounds. So let me try eating something else. And so I started eating things like fruits and vegetables, amazing concepts that were new to me at the time. And, and so uh, I within a year, I lost more than 100 pounds. And then over the next couple of years, I got rid of the last 20 or so. So um, so that was 50 years ago, uh, amazingly. And uh, oh, another piece of real magic happened. A couple of days later, after I embarked on this new life, I got a call from a friend of mine, Neil Marinello, who worked at the school. And he said he was going up the road about 30 miles to visit an old Harvard professor of his. And I said, well, what's that all about? And he said, well, I don't know, but he's gone to India and he's kind of had some enlightenment experience and he's gonna be visiting his dad's uh, estate, which was just down the road from where I lived in New Hampshire. So I hopped in the car and we went down there and it turned out to be Ram Dass. Uh, and I'd heard of him because he'd been involved in LSD and stuff at Harvard, but I didn't know about the whole India thing. And he had just gotten back from India for his first time, and he had all his robes on. And I remember there were all these young men and women that were floating around offering people fruit and things like that. And it was like nothing I had ever seen before. But I talked to Ramdas. Uh, we we listened to him and he talked for three hours without notes, which just blew me away. Uh, but I went to, up to him afterwards and I said, take a look at me. I just had this big wake up experience. What would you recommend I do? And he said something amazing that really changed my life. He said, well, in India, if they had some or whatever, they might go to a yoga retreat or do some breathing activities or, or a meditation intensive um, instead of doing therapy or maybe going on a diet or something. But uh, that's what I would recommend you do. And I said, well, where would I find out about that? And he said, don't worry, something will come to you. <laughs> okay, that was appropriately mystical. So, but the next day I'm in the supermarket pushing my cart out and I look over to my left and there's a little kiosk with paperback books on it. And one of them said Yoga, Youth and Reincarnation by Jess Stern. And I looked it up on Amazon. You can still buy it here 50 years later, but it was this little paperback. And basically all it was, was one breathing yoga and meditation activity after another, a whole book full. And so I just started doing that stuff. Later on, I I got formal meditation training in a Zen monastery and then learned TM and uh, still do that. Um, but it was that first moment of buying that little book that got me really started. And within a year, pretty much everything I had changed. The relationship had changed. I was out of that. And even my vision changed. So I no longer needed to use my glasses to yeah. pass my driver's test. So uh, it was a magical year. And basically, it's been a magical 50 years ever since. I'm so glad. That's an amazing story. Do you think everyone has this opportunity for that fall and hit their head on ice? Maybe not that dramatic, but for this sense of, of feeling and seeing and being aware of that pure consciousness within us. 
I actually do. And I think it's not necessary to fall and hit your head on the uh, ice to do it. See, the way I put it to my students now, I said, the universe is totally willing to tickle us with a feather to teach us. But if we're not paying attention, it'll then hit us over the head with a sledgehammer. But it's our openness to learning that really makes it happen fast. I think See, I think at the time I was so stuck that I kind of needed a big whomp on the seat of the pants by the universe. And I don't think I'd been paying attention because uh, otherwise I could have probably gotten the message a lot friendlier way. But I don't think you're going to need to fall to do it out there, folks. Don't uh, no. don't go out, hit your head on the uh, pavement just because I said so. Not the message we're sending here. but <laughs> Now, you were at the time when that happened, you were you said you were working. Was it for a boy's home that you were working with? Was this yeah. something that you uh, like helping, you know, the helping of others and things like that? Is that something that you've always been drawn to? And then you took that forward in your own personal development? Has that always been a part of your life? Well, I think I started out that way, and then I kind of lost it for a while. A funny family story they tell me is that when I was five years old for my birthday, I got a tricycle, and it was raining outside, and so I got permission to ride it. My grandmother had a huge living room, and so I got permission to ride my tricycle back and forth around in her living room. And the first thing I did, I got my granddad to bring in a cardboard box and I put it in the corner and that was my office. And I would commute to my little office on my tricycle and get in the box. And guess what I did in the box? I offered my services to help people solve their problems. And uh, I don't know where I got hold of this idea because I lived in Leesburg, Florida, occupied uh, you know, population 10,000, and there was no psychiatrist or psychologist or anything like that. There was about 10 different churches. That was about it. And uh, wherever I got that idea, though, uh, and my family thought it was hilarious that this little boy would ride his trike over and, and sit there and think people were going to uh, come to him for problems. But uh, it turned out that's what I do for my whole life now. So <laughs> it ended up good. Um, I'll tell you, though, I was an English major in college. And I was hooked by the idea that I wanted to write the great American novel. You know, I wanted to be a novelist. I loved to write ever since I was a kid. My mom was a newspaper uh, reporter and a columnist for the newspaper. So I kind of come from a, a writing lineage. And my granddad was a big wordsmith and everything. So this kind of a, a family trade is uh, writing. I just took it into a different dimension by writing self-help books and mystery novels and things like that mystery novels out. I mean, I've not read those. So that's, that's on. Oh, the yeah. As a matter of fact, let me uh, just show you something here. <laughs> uh, I write mystery novels about two different heroes. This says the fifth rule of 10. I know it's a little hard to read, but I invented a character, a Tibetan Buddhist Lama um, who grew up and became a cop in LA and then became wow. a private detective. Okay. And so I've written um, five books, uh, six books now about uh, uh, Tenzing Norbu. He goes by the nickname of 10. And so this is the, uh, all of them have a, are based around a metaphysical rule oh, yeah. or law. Oh my right? gosh, to I can't wait to read this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I also have a second series of mystery novels about uh, an Englishman a hundred years ago. He's kind of a crosstown competitor of Sherlock Holmes. His name is Sir Errol Hyde. So I have three out about that. That's what I do in the early morning hours uh, between five and seven before my wife gets up as I, I get up early and I write mystery novels. That's so great. Oh my gosh. Oh my That's gosh. so wonderful. Um, I wanted to uh, circle back also about this idea. Um, I've seen you, I've heard you talk about it a little bit before, and I also saw the references to it in uh, the Learning to Love Yourself workbook, where you talk about the, the essence, like the, and it's like the pure, this pure consciousness. And I'm curious about, like, just to hear your perspective on that and to hear you talk about that just a little bit more is like, is that sort of, is that what the, what's referred to, you know, like in the, in the uh, Vedanta philosophy and in other spiritual philosophies of just that, that pure consciousness, the, the Brahman of, you know, the, the substratum of all, of all, and, and how do you think about that as it relates to like how we function in our lives, you know, is it to get back home to that? Or I'd just like to hear you talk a little bit more about that. Yes. Well, what I call essence is that 
pure part of ourselves that expresses who we really are. If you took that away, you wouldn't be you. And so we have certain essence qualities inside us. And as far as the pure consciousness goes, yes, I believe it is what the uh, Vedanta folks were talking about with Brahman consciousness. I think that uh, it's a gift that everybody has, that kind of pure consciousness. The value of it that I've come to um, really appreciate is that it does give me a place to come home to, that it's underneath all the phenomena of my life. It's underneath the thoughts, it's underneath all my feelings. All of those things are very important. But if you know, for example, that you have sad feelings or angry feelings or scared feelings, but that underneath that is that vast ocean of pure consciousness that's just you because you might be scared about something that happened when you were five years old that wouldn't have happened to the person next door. So everybody's got a different set of programming and life experiences. But imagine if you had grown up in the house next door and you'd gone to a different high school and you'd gone to a different junior high school and you'd been in a different family, but you would still have this thing that I'm talking about. You would have a different set of flavors on top of it, but the actual pure expression would be there just like it is for you and me and everyone else. And I think that in life, our job, our kind of our spiritual job is to find that aspect of ourself and, and open up to it and let ourselves be grounded and centered in it. Um, because otherwise, there's too much pull and push in life, you know, that um, one day you're up, next day you're down, one day you're happy, next day you're sad. In a way, that's going to be fluctuating all the time. But look for that part of yourself that's not fluctuating, that pure part of yourself that's the you, that if everything else was taken away, you would still be you. That, like that, I love the word essence for it, that essence of that very uh, unique uh, and purest uh, expression of your of yourself, you know? I think, I think, I just think that's amazing. It's like taking away the pairs of opposites and the attachments to the pairs of opposites and just landing in this centered awareness kind of thing. That's really a good way to put it because a lot of life has duality built into it. Yes, no, yes, no. Those are important, but look underneath that. Where What's underneath that? Or black, white, brown, red, all of those differences that people have as far as different flavors, but we're all the same at the center. Yeah, and, and I love the way that you talk about it. It's like that place to come home to. Uh, it, it, it's funny, this is something I've been thinking about a little bit recently as well as like how we want to try to put words on it or labels on it, but it really is something that is so far beyond that. It, it is, uh, it's not, it's not a feeling. It's, it's a state of being that we drop into and, and just changes everything. I, I don't know. That's, that's kind of how I think about that essence, you know, and tapping into it. Yeah, I think it's really, that is it. And see, once I learned meditation and breath work and things like that, I could contact that place without having to fall down on my back. As a matter of fact, uh, the little book I bought, I took it home that afternoon and I just started doing the activities about three o'clock in the afternoon. Started with the chapter on yoga and then I moved to the chapter on breathing and I just did one activity after the other. It was about midnight when I got to the meditation chapter. And it was just a very simple meditation that was in the book. I think it was just like use uh, Ram at, or Om as the mantra. You just close your eyes, Om, Om. And I did it for about two minutes. And I was right back in that same pure consciousness place that I'd had to fall down on my back to get hold of the first time. It was just right there. And I've been a daily meditator now uh, for 50 years, almost coming up on my 50th anniversary of meditating every day. And one of the reasons I do that is I think having a contact with that pure consciousness on a daily basis is one of the most biggest things we can do for our mental and emotional well-being, as well as just getting stuff done out in the world. Because all of my ideas for my books come after meditation in the morning. I'll do my first meditation in the morning. And then for a little while afterwards, my mind is just popping with different ideas. And I think it's because 
we all have this creative essence in ourselves, but most of us don't take the time to kind of dive down in there deep enough to get to it and let it flow. Um, I mean, if you think of just how creative the universe is, I mean, it's amazing. I read a while back that there's a place in outer space where the universe is producing 32 suns, just like our sun, every second. It's spewing out suns, like our sun, 32 per second. I mean, that's amazing. And if, I mean, and, and here we're, we, we're sitting in our own miniature version of that, because if you just sit quietly, you'll start having ideas flow out, just like that place out there is spewing out suns because the universe is in the process of creativity. That's what it's all about. And so to get in touch with our creativity, we just need to kind of get down in there and honor who we are as universal human beings. Wow. That's so yeah. good. Would you say that, and, and I'd like to maybe bring in some of the experience that we're all going through worldwide around COVID. It's just going to be a year next week where it's, it's for us anyways, the lockdown. Are we putting too much importance on the noise in the world so that we're missing out on this time of connecting with the ultimate state within? Definitely. Um, because, well, for one thing, I mean, you, you do definitely have to pay attention to what's going on in the world, but it's the question of identifying it, you know, identifying with it. Um, I think that the best way to view the current circumstance, and by the way, I just got my second shot the other day. Um, so um, okay. that part of it is playing out. So it's not going to be too long mm -hmm. before things are moving along again in a different way. Frankly, though, I think for many people I've talked to, COVID has been a gift in a way because it's allowed many people to kind of slow down a little bit and focus on what's important. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's amazing. Like uh, I noticed that sales of the big leap doubled and tripled during um, the pandemic. I think because people had some time to sit down and kind of think about where their lives and that book um, helps people get in touch with their upper limit problem and also what their zone of genius is. And I think this has uh, given people a lot of opportunities to do that. I know there's a tremendous amount of pain and suffering that has gone along with it. But I think the enlightenment perspective is that it's sure given people a chance to find out what's important to them. And, and let's hope that that then begins to inform all of our lives later. Yeah. In so many areas. I mean, I remember when it started in the lockdown in India, we're very much in touch with our teacher and fellow students at the Vedanta Academy. And all of a sudden, you know, in New Delhi, they're seeing the Himalayan mountains, like the air pollution is clearing away. It's, it, there were so many gifts along with so much suffering and not to at all minimize the suffering, but if we can keep focusing on, like you said, those, those places that arise within us where we're more clear it's not for nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not at all surprised that that, that book uh, saw such an <laughs> increase because you know, you sit around for a little bit with yourself and all of a sudden those things are taken away and sooner or later you start to ask like, hey, why am I not taking action on these things? Like, like where am I stopping myself in this? I, I truly... Like that was the book that we discovered first and, and it's, uh, it's truly extraordinary. I hadn't heard anybody... Uh, break down the the challenges around self-sabotage and upper limiting in such a concise and, and beautiful mm -hmm. way. And the, the, the instructions that you gave throughout it were just incredible. And a big leap. I feel like every person who reads it has a moment where it's like they kind of stop breathing and realize the choices that have been made where they either didn't move into you know, their zone of genius or stopped at something. I mean, it's, it's a profound moment where it's important to face. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that and the upper limit problem that you share in the book? 
Yes. Well, I began studying this a long time. I always tell people it took me 30 years to write The Big Leap. I thought about it for 29 years. And then one year I sat down and actually got around to writing it. But I've been thinking about this since way back in the 1980s. And I had the opportunity actually back into the 70s, because when I was working on my PhD at Stanford in the 70s, I happened to live there in Palo Alto, where Silicon Valley was beginning to start. And there were all these amazingly bright people working for these amazing firms that did things that I didn't, couldn't even, didn't even know what they did, you know, all these high tech kind of things. But as I was working there as a, uh, in the counseling center where people could come from the community, a lot of people came from Silicon Valley and I worked with these incredible bright executives, but no matter how smart and effective they were, I saw them sabotaging themselves over and over and over again. And as I began to look into it, what is causing this? And as I began to look into it, I realized that I did the same kind of thing. The upper limit problem is really when, when you knock yourself back down after things have been going really well. You, you run up against a glass ceiling of some kind of limiting belief, and then you knock yourself back down to where you were before. Uh, many people, for example, have had the upper limit problem happen on a diet. You go on a diet, and let's say you're, you've, you've vowed to eat nothing but uh, smoothies for three days that you that you buy diet smoothies and it's going to take 20 pounds off of you in a week well maybe it works great for three days and you lose the first five pounds and then you say oh, wow i've lost five pounds let me go out and celebrate with an ice cream sundae you know and and so all of us have different ways of upper limiting ourselves what i noticed the silicon valley executives often did they'd have a big breakthrough at work and then they go home and have a big fight with their spouse or family. Sometimes it worked the other way around. Sometimes things would be going well at home. They'd have some breakthrough with the family and then they go into work and have some kind of cataclysmic event there. As I studied it, I realized that what happens first is that there's an unconscious fear that starts happening in the person and then that causes them to do the self-sabotage move. And so I plotted out and figured out what the fears were that are underneath that. And I want everybody to know what they are because we all have them. One of them is a fear of outshining other people where you have some belief inside that you're not quite worthy to shine in your full light. You, have, you need to tone it down because it'll make other people feel bad. Gifted kids often get that message. Just tone it down, you know, don't be the one up in front of the class waving your arm. I know you know the answer, but, uh, you know, so, uh, so the fear of outshining is one. Perhaps the biggest one, and I've seen this with Hollywood movie stars and Grammy winners and high-powered uh, high executives, even at people at the very height of their field, often suffer from a fear of being fundamentally flawed in some way. There's something deep inside them that they feel bad about, something they've done or something that was done to them, but they carry around a feeling of being fundamentally unworthy of having their full measure of abundance or love or recognition. And so what happens is they start moving in a positive direction, then that old fear comes up and enters their mind and says, oh, you don't deserve this. And then sure enough, they do something to limit themselves. You see this all the time in, uh, in life out, you know, you'll see somebody like John Belushi has at one point the number one record, the number one TV show and the number one movie. And the next thing he dies of a drug overdose. So there are all these terrible examples of that, but you don't need to look for the real bad ones. Just look for the ones you do at home, you know, like starting an argument after having something go really well for a couple of days or, um, we call it around here, you know, my wife and I have seen, Katie and I have seen, I think 4,500 different couples over the years in our office or in our um, seminars. And one thing couples always tell us about is the Friday night fights and the Sunday night fights. It's often a pattern for couples to get into an argument on Friday night or get into an argument on Sunday night. And the reason for that is we've kind of worked with people is that people are worried on Friday night about this whole weekend of potential for intimacy. And 
Mm -hmm. good feeling and if you don't feel like you deserve that then you'll do something like start an argument or um self deserve just really have an uh, have an accident is another yeah. big thing that oftentimes is an upper limit problem too right that's something that uh that was really uh helpful for me uh is between the two of us i just noticed uh that there would be these funny little arguments and i stopped <laughs> i it really helped me to stop that's looking cute. at it as uh like you know whatever she's doing or and really look at what was going on inside of me that would want to um break the connection and kind of stop that flow and uh it, it was i mean it was incredibly helpful i haven't I really talked we're going to be going to one of the workshops I, yeah i think we will <laughs> i haven't really talked to you about it too much but i mean that's something that i had i had noticed in myself i just thought mm -hmm. was really mm -hmm. really really helpful and, and you see it in those funny little patterns you know you mentioned um that uh when something really good happens people, they celebrate it, right? But it's so funny to me that oftentimes that celebration is something that's going to have a consequence that will squash all those feelings. Like, what, what do you what do you think about that? Is that is that well, part of the upper limiting problem? Or is there something else around that? I think it is the upper limit problem. It's the upper limit problem happens because things start going a little better, a little more intimacy, maybe, or you go on the diet and you're feeling better after a few days. And I think, though, what that happens is it's like a test. Um, uh, the, the universe kind of throws up little tests for us. You know, can you make it past? Like what happened for me, I don't, can't remember if I wrote this in The Big Leap or not, but when I first started losing that weight, I lost about 35 or 40 pounds, and I was feeling better than I'd felt in a long time. And even though if you looked at me, I was still fat, I, I felt very different. I think I'd gotten down, maybe even weighed... Uh, I think I'd gotten down from about 320 or so down to about 275. So I was coming up on almost losing 50 pounds. And I was really getting into the groove and exercising and that kind of thing. And then I was walking past in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I was walking past an ice cream shop and I saw this family in there all surrounding a big banana split and they were all eating it about four or five people. And I just lost my head. And I, <laughs> I went in there and I said, I want one of those, you know, and for one person, <laughs> I can't believe it now, but I got about, I, I ate a lot of the ice cream or the banana split. And for about 20 minutes, I felt great. Sugar. You know, I remember walking down a sugar high, you know, I was just king of the world. And then I literally 20 minutes later was doubled over in the street. Um, and so that was the last time. I think a lot of times you have to do that to yourself a couple of times before you kind of get the message. But that was the last big one I did on the diet. I did a few little ones later on, but boy, uh, it left such an impression on me that <laughs> that's my last banana split I've ever had in my life it was 50 years ago. Do you do any sort of treats or special desserts or anything now? Or are you a super clean eater? Uh, oh, well, yeah, we have desserts uh, from time to time. My wife doesn't really eat dessert, uh, so I'm the only one that does. But I will occasionally uh, have some ice cream or something like that. But uh, it doesn't have any pull on me anymore. You know, it's it's not something that uh, I think about or anything like that because I've gotten over the hat. You know, I remember the very first time I consciously ate an apple because I was thinking about eating a Hershey bar and... I, instead, I chose an apple. I was feeling this pull of a Hershey bar and I couldn't get my mind off the fantasy, but I happened to have an apple and I ate the apple very slowly and mindfully. And I almost had a, another enlightenment experience just eating an apple. You know, I took maybe 15 or 20 minutes to really eat it. And the funny thing is when I finished it, I didn't have any desire for a Hershey bar after that. You know, so I think that uh, life was trying to teach me a whole bunch of ways to make myself be able to stay in that essence place. And I feel embarrassed sometimes that it took me to 24. I wish I'd figured it out when I was 10 or 12, but in a way it doesn't matter because I've had 50 years of things going great. 
Yeah, yes. an absolutely amazing career. Yeah, I wish I could say that I pulled that together at 24. It took me a little <laughs> longer. <laughs> I'm still on the train. I'm still like, all well, right. That's great, that you, that's great that you're studying Vedanta, though, because uh, that's uh, that's one of the great paths of it. It's probably what my own personal theology resembles more than anything else. I used to be a student of uh, Krishnamurti. Oh, Right, oh, right. We yeah. go to Swami Parthasarathy's Vedanta Academy. Well, I've been going every year for 13 years, except this year. So it's yeah. the morning study. And it, it is, I have to say, it kept kept this intact during this past year, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned in The Big Leap, uh, The Genius Zone, and I, I'm really excited. I understand that you have a new book coming out where you're going to expand on this, which I, I, I'm I'm very excited to dive into a little bit more because I got it. I think I got the the general concept of it in that, and I've definitely kind of been playing around with it. Uh, but it, it's uh, it's really a topic I think that warrants a, a even more discussion and a continued discussion about it. Like, a leap. yeah, a can, leap, can you tell us a little bit more about <laughs> about this book? I'm really excited to hear about it. Well, the grand payoff at the end of working through some of your upper limits problems is you get to live in what I call the genius zone. And the genius zone is when you're doing what you most love to do and also what makes your biggest contribution to people and the world around you. So when I first thought of this, I realized I'm only spending 10% of my own time doing what I most love to do. I was a university professor at the University of Colorado after I uh, got my doctorate and left Stanford. And so I, I, I love being a university professor, but there's a tremendous amount of stuff that they don't tell you when you sign up to be a university professor, like committees you gotta serve on. And at a university, if there's five minutes of business a university committee can turn it into a three hour discussion. You know, in the business world, it would never work. You know, everybody would get fired if they took that long to make some simple decision. Uh, when I first went to the university, my first faculty meeting, they, somebody uh, brought up the idea of having plus or minus grades rather than A, B, C, D, F, have A minus, B plus, et cetera. And they, I watched them this was my first meeting, so I, I didn't open my mouth, but I watched people have this passionate argument back and forth about this and took up a couple of hours, you know, and at the end of it, I stuck up my innocent hand, my first uh, professor job, and got called on, and I said, hey, you know, why don't we just try it out for a year and see if everybody likes it? Whoa, you would think I would have suggested mass nudity in the faculty parking lot or something. People, oh, no, we couldn't possibly. We've got to discuss this. We've got to look at all angles of it. And they, they had a couple of different committees they appointed to look at different angles of it. Here's the bottom line. 12 years later, they decided to implement plus or minus grades for a year to see if everybody liked it. And so... Uh, were you long gone by then? Well, no, I was long gone from faculty meetings. That was my last faculty meeting that I went to. They weren't required. So I figured, okay, friends, I'm out of here. And so, uh, uh, but uh, God bless the universities of the world. I, I love them. They're great places and everything. But for an impatient kind of guy like me, it was a good venue. So I, uh, I loved it for 20 years. And then, then I always say Oprah struck. Um, we, uh, we, Katie and I wrote a book called Conscious Loving that was a summary of what we'd learned about relationships. And uh, we had uh, Oprah show call and say, would you like to come talk about it on our show? And at the time, I didn't have a television set. And so I was unfamiliar with talk shows and Oprah Winfrey and things like that. Uh, but my secretary at the time, she said, she's really big, she's really pop, you know? And uh, so I said, sure. So the next thing we knew, we're out in Chicago, on Oprah with Conscious Loving, and then sort of life went into overdrive for about the last 30 years ever since then. And we were on there other times during the 90s. But uh, uh, I always say, uh, people ask me what being on Oprah is like. And I say, well, go down to the coffee shop and order 10 shots of espresso and drink them in order. And then for about an hour after that, that's, that's what it's being like. And so uh, we ended up uh, 
in our post Oprah years, I think going around the world more than 30 times teaching seminars in 25 different countries and, of course, writing more books and things like that. So I'll always be very, very grateful to Oprah, who lives not far from me now, um, to uh, for having us on her show for all those times. She's wow. wise. Yeah, She's incredible. a wise one. And then the Genius Zone is your next book coming out, correct? Yes. Yes, it'll be out in June. Uh, they tell me it's going to be out on June 29th. I've learned to take everything a publisher say with a grain of salt. So let's just uh, assume, though, that it's going to be out this summer and uh, be delighted to come back around and tell you all about that one. But what it does, basically, it takes what's in the big leap and gives you a way of diving right down into your genius zone. So um, I, it's kind of like... Uh, instead of flying the plane to your uh, genius zone, it gives you a very nice parachute, a way to just go straight down and uh, capture it. So it's a kind of a key to your yeah. genius zone. You learn some processes in the book that give you a real quick way of getting into that space and how to stay there once you're there. So it's kind of a, a map to the genius zone. Oh, that's incredible. I'm so excited. Would you consider the big leap and the work in that book a prerequisite for it? Or can they just dive right into the right into the genius zone? It would be great if they read the big leap first, because it's kind of a sequel to the big leap. Yeah. Um, but uh, the way it's going now, by by the time the book rolls around, everybody on earth will have read the big leap. Yeah. <laughs> right. I love it Hopefully, so yeah. <laughs> I think it's important. Like it's it's so important. Now, you and your wife work together. And I'm curious, like we, we, we work together as well. So this, I guess, maybe is a little bit more of a personal question. We work question. together and we don't work together. We have both. Yeah, we, yeah, we do separate. a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, that we found that to be our nice kind of happy little groove <laughs> there is I have my thing, she has her thing. And then we come together for like the podcast and other stuff. But what, what we've found is that there are some unique nuances to that in a relationship. And I mean, I can't think of anybody better to ask than you about this, you know, doing this kind of work with your wife for, for, for this many years. Um, what, if you could offer some advice or some insight around that, what, what would you say? Yes, we've done a lot of work on that, helping other couples learn how to work together, including some very prominent ones that you'd probably uh, recognize. Uh, often, interestingly enough, people come to us because they try to work together and then they hit some horrendous problem that kind of blows them out of the water. And <laughs> we got one couple referred to us after they had gotten into an argument on stage at a seminar and had to be kind of intervent, uh, what do you call it, intervene or have an intervention on them in the middle of the conference. Oh. And so uh, that's often where we get people down here in our office. But there are some tricks to the trade. There are some real secrets that I think can make it a success. First of all, I think you've really got to want to collaborate because it's harder than working with one person. If you do it right, it's better because you have two synergized minds and hearts working together. But when barriers come up, that gets to be a big problem. Uh, oftentimes, the issues that come up are issues of, of competitiveness or control that come up about whose ideas or who's going to be the boss here or who's going to have more of the say here. As a matter of fact, I got to tell you a funny story. The first time we were on Oprah, we insisted that they take us as a couple because when they called, they said, we'd like to have one of you come out and, and be on the show. And we said, no, this is a book written by a couple. We'll come if we can be on as a couple. And interestingly enough, they said, oh, you know, we don't like to spend more than one airplane ticket. You know, they gave us some resistance about that. And I said, come on, you know. And uh, so <laughs> right on the show, it says, you know, promotional considerations by Northwest Airlines or whatever it was. So I know they pass out first class tickets. So anyway, we ended up with our two first class tickets to Chicago. Uh, but even when we got there and we were backstage getting ready to go on, we were going to work with some couples up on the stage. And one of the producers comes running in and he says, whatever you do, don't do any therapy with them. <laughs> I said, what do you mean exactly? And he said, 
well, we had this one guest that was always trying to dig into their childhoods and it didn't work very well and the audience didn't like it. He said, you know, kind of stick to these quickie kind. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll do what I can, you know. So, uh, but it worked out just great. They, uh, uh, you know, the audience really loved us and uh, there's nothing ha like having an Oprah audience stand up and start cheering for you, you know, it's really a great feeling. But um, so there's a secret that we have discovered over the years called telling the absolute truth to each other at all times in all ways. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any secrets from each other. We don't ever go into working together with anything on our minds or hearts that we haven't cleared up outside of there. And so we just have a policy around here about handling stuff as it comes up. And so I can remember many times early in our times when we worked together where we would have stuff come up at the last minute, you know, some kind of a issue come up and be hassling each other about it or something. But gradually we learned to get ourselves kind of cleared out before we started doing the work. So we would sit down for an hour before we went on one of those shows and just say, okay, is there anything here that's in the way of going to get in the way of getting our message out? Mm -hmm. And yeah. then we would rehearse over and over again, saying our message in one minute, 20 seconds, because that's often all you have on a talk show, you know, as, as you've got that hot minute and 20 seconds, you can really get your um, message out before they want you to move on and do something else. So uh, we would even be in the shower together and I'd say, hey, Katie, what's the essence of conscious loving in 10 seconds or less? And she would belt it out, you know? And uh, so we do a lot of practice like that. We still love working together. Although now Katie has kind of turned into the main teacher in the family. She does a lot of our trainings, mm -hmm. uh, which are now on Zoom and I, other formats. Um, watching her on YouTube, she's fabulous. Oh, she is the most wonderful teacher. She can do it all day long too, because she loves it so much. I'm kind of a, I, you, you call her a marathon runner. I'm a sprinter. I like to do about a hot hour and that's about it. And uh, so uh, what I'm doing with you is about the amount of attention span I usually have to, and then I want to go, go outside and breathe some fresh air and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'd love to invite her on the show. So we'll follow up there. I know that you have an engagement. Did you have anything else to ask? No, those, I, I have, got to ask all my questions and more. I'm so grateful. I have one, one question that I love. We don't have guests a lot when we do. They're so special, such as yourself. And the question I like to ask, is there anything that's in your heart that you want to do uh, before you leave the planet that you've not told anybody? Mm, let me just tune into that. I've never been asked that question before. I always like a first time. Let me tune in. Is there anything? I can't really think of anything. I figured out early on what I wanted. To, I figured out in my book, Five Wishes, I talk about the five things that I wanted to create in my life. And I've created them or beyond my wildest dreams. Like one of my big goals for my life was to create a relationship with a woman with whom I could grow and change over the whole lifetime and I didn't find her till I was 34 I I made every mate relationship mistake that's possible to make in my teens and 20s I think but I struck gold in my 30s and uh, met Katie and uh, we've um, we're in our 42nd year together now and so we've created this magical life together and written 10 books together and everything I never would have imagined that I would ever become anything like a relationship expert, given what I grew up around. You know, I, I grew up in a single parent family where I never saw any healthy relationships or anything like that. And so uh, I feel so blessed that I, I got to learn these particular things that enabled me to create uh, the life that I've created. So I have to say, uh, if uh, the universe needs me uh, in the collective anytime soon, I'm ready and willing to go. I'm having a great time while I'm here, but I've uh, accomplished all my major goals and I'm just enjoying living more and more of them every day. I love, love that. Yeah. That's the best. Yeah. yeah. Well, Dr. Gay Hendricks, thank you so much for being here. We can't wait till your book comes out, The Genius Zone, and we'll have links to The Big Leap. And I also love Conscious Loving 
and conscious luck we didn't even talk about that there's just oh yeah well come i'll come back again one of these days and we'll talk about that's a whole great subject in itself yeah no, but i'm waiting for my copy to arrive i, I can't wait to first. dive into yeah. it we, we, <laughs> we have our own copies that's one rule that we have or agreement i should say yeah. i get my copy he gets that's his. right <laughs> well when the new book comes out i'm going to make sure each of you get an autographed copy right away thank oh you. my gosh thank, thank you. you yeah well it's been such a pleasure thank you so much god bless and we hope to see you in person up there for one of your workshops so you'll be here good well come see us anytime we live in a spot of paradise up here okay thank All you right. so much thank you namaste Thanks to you